it doesn't rest on my abilities to, you know, my skills, my capacity, it rests on the capacity of Jesus, <laughs> right? It rests on his skills, on his capacity. Welcome to Real Faith, Real World, where we connect the faith within us with the world around us. This podcast is a resource of World Methodist Evangelism, where we connect, equip, and encourage networks of Christian leaders to build faith-sharing movements around the world. My name is Rob Haynes. I want to thank you for listening and express my thanks to the generosity of Christ Church Memphis for supporting Real Faith, Real World. We continue our series on innovating church, and today we focus on church planting. Our guest is Chase Stansel, who has a lifetime of experience in church planning and is currently serving in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Chase, welcome to Real Faith, Real World. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on this episode. It is great to have you here. Um, You know, there's a million things that I could tell everybody about you, but why don't you introduce yourself first? Oh, man. Uh... (laughs) Okay, uh, I am Chase Stansel. Uh, I am married to Christine Stansel. We have been married for 16 years. We have the privilege of raising four adults who have started off as children. Nice. Um, nice. Their ages are 15, 13, 10, and our youngest just turned eight this month. Uh, we also have a two year old Great Dane. And um, he is um, both one of my great, great joys and annoyances um, (laughs) because he is truly, he's a really, really good dog. Honestly, he's like one of the best dogs on the planet, not just because he's mine. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, But he also follows me around everywhere I go. He's like a really, really big 3D shadow. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I'm the pastor at Unison Christian Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're a multi-ethnic urban church. Um, and um, I feel like um, I'm also I'm also a musician. Uh, I love, love music. I feel like that's enough about me, though. <laughs> and you have <laughs> like been there. involved. Yeah. Well, you've been involved with World Methodist Evangelism through things like Order the Flame uh, and, yeah. and these opportunities as well, which we've done other um, uh, podcasts or, or dribbled uh, and shared information about Order the Flame through so many different episodes. And so we just really appreciate all the ways that you serve uh, the broader uh, Wesleyan Methodist family all across. So, yeah, yes. Well, we're uh, here to talk a little bit about our series on innovating church, and your work in particular has been around uh, church planting. So um, uh, before we get too deep into uh, some of the problems around church planting or some of the the things that have been going on, I just want to ask you real generally, why do we need to plant churches? I mean, aren't there enough already, and there's all these churches closing, so... Why plant a church? Let's start there. So um, I remember like getting into church planting some years ago and they like, you know, uh, would talk about like statistically speaking, church plants um, reach more uh, unbelievers than established churches. And I think that was kind of the, um, that was the initial, I would say motivation, like the motivational, like, you know, locker room coach in the middle of, you know, halftime, they tell you, yeah, yeah, this is what we're rallying around. <laughs> right, right. But at the, but at the end of the day, I think um, we plant churches because um, Jesus said that, you know, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the reality is everything has a, a, a birth, a life mm-hmm. and a death, even mm-hmm. local congregations. And right. so as congregations, um, as congregations, end that season in the earth yeah. there has to be some representation of the the body of christ in that area um because that's his words that <laughs> right like what the church is his bride and right. he's taking care of his bride um but also i think that there is um there is also a reality that con- context 
in ministry matters. Um, mm-hmm. Context is always changing. Culture is always changing. Right. And what connects with people is always evolving. Thus, the church has to always be evolving as well for us to be an adequate witness wherever we are. So I really think those are the real reasons we're, we, we plant churches. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I think there's a there's a ton of different things we can talk about there. But first, why don't you kind of give everyone a little bit of your church planting history so that we can launch from there? And then Solid. I want to talk about the the cycle of the church you just mentioned there. Yeah. So I so Unison, which is the, uh, again that's the church where I get to be the lead pastor, uh, is seven years old. Right. Uh, so I got to be the I call it the lead planter for that. Mm. I feel a little bit too young to be like, say, the, you know, founding pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 37, so yeah. like I feel like that just feels like when I'm 52, then I'll say I was the founding pastor. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I I am uh, so that that was. Um, I've known for a long time that I was called to be a pastor. Yeah. Um, and and it was really an interesting thing in that I I felt a call to ministry even before understanding um the the backdrop of even my family of you know of, of mm. planting churches. My my dad planted um you know planted a church in Battle Creek, Michigan. My uh, you know, his grandfather planted three churches in Michigan and mm. um and which I actually didn't even know about until after going, coming into ministry. It's like, what? What? This is crazy. So uh, I guess I come from a long line of church planters. But um, that journey was, um, I've been always very, very passionate and yeah. dedicated to urban ministry, mm-hmm. um, believing that we need healthy churches, um, vibrant churches in the inner city. Um, uh, and, and in many ways, because of our um, you know, our models of successful ministry, uh, they really are geared toward a much more suburban uh, model, honestly, a, right. you know, a, sub- sure. a suburban model of ministry. Um, and we've looked to those churches, which is a way to do ministry, but we've looked to those churches um, to kind of define for us what is successful and ultimately believing that um, that isn't uh, that isn't the mark of success mm. in ministry. It is mm. a mark of success in ministry, and right. and where the people are is where the church needs to be. And our cities continue to grow. Mm. So if we abandon our cities, then we are missing out on the opportunity to truly bear witness um, for the gospel where there is actual consistent development and growth and need for uh, His presence. So I, I'm just sitting there thinking, I, I know lots of people who are pastors who are the, you know, the children of pastors and grandchildren of pastors. I don't know that I know anybody who is a church planter, the child of a church planter and the grandchild of a church planter. I mean, look at that. Yo, that is awesome. I didn't even know I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say this. It's been an interesting journey because I, I felt a call to, to ministry when I was 14. Yeah. And I was a worship leader at a church um, when I was 17. And my mm. dad planted a church when I turned 17. Oh, wow. uh, well, shortly after I turned 17. And he, and I, so I actually never was a part of his church. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, he he, he um, came to me and said, like, hey, I'm, I'm starting a church. And I want you to pray about where you should be. And I yeah. did. And really, the Lord told me to stay where I was. Wow. Uh, and um, which is one of, honestly, one of my favorite m- memories yeah. of how my dad um, discipled me, oh, right? Wow. Like he, his role in discipling me was not mm-hmm. just do what we're doing or yeah. do what I'm doing. It really was seek the Lord and whatever the Lord is doing, that's what you need to be doing, wow. right? Uh, wow. So um, wow. so that that's always been a part of that journey for me too. Yeah. Uh, um, am I, um, and my, uh, his grandfather, uh, planting churches in Battle Creek. Uh, I honestly didn't know that until actually I had already uh, planted a church. So it was mm. such a wild thing to to see that yeah. my and then there was also my uncle, uh, excuse me, my my father's uncle. So that that generation there also mm. planted a church in wow. California, and so it's so we're just like this is this is what we do apparently. Yeah, we churches, right. <laughs> 
We're entrepreneurs for the kingdom of God. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So now, yeah. now you are a Wesleyan pastor, pastor in the Wesleyan Church, yep. and were yes. all of those others in the Wesleyan denomination as well, or were they other a variety? Oh no, no, no. My dad um, actually didn't learn about the Wesleyan Church until I was in my mid twenties. Okay. Um, uh, my my dad planted a non denominational church. Right. My great grandfather planted. Um, uh, Church of God in Christ. So yeah. churches mm-hmm. that were a part of the Church of God in Christ denomination. Right. And um, my uh, great uncle, um, Baptist Church. Okay. So, like, so we're kind of okay. all over. All over the place. So let's <laughs> hey. talk about just a minute ago when you were talking about that the churches have a have a cycle. And some sometimes yeah. those, they, they die. Um, when you say that, I think what you mean is a local congregation as a group of people, right? You're not necessarily talking about the idea of the mission of God as expressed in the church universal. Can you talk a little bit about that first? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It really, in some ways points to that idea that context is always evolving. Yeah. Right. So, so um, I I think that's, that's kind of the, 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 the mental picture I work with is everything has a birth, a life and a death. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. The mission of Christ does not, does not die, but I, believe the mission of Christ doesn't die because he keeps calling people into yeah. starting churches, right? Right, right. <laughs> because those local congregations, those local representations of the church, there's no way in the world they can continue, they could evolve at the rate of which all of the cultural contexts around them are evolving. They just can't. Sure. Um, and, and, and even the ones that do the best job of doing so, they still end at some point Mm. um they still they still close their door at some point making way for a um for uh, for a representation of the body of christ who honestly better fits that context yeah um uh, the holy spirit raises up some folks who will better fit that context and that shouldn't be something that causes us to be afraid or to 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 be frustrated it's a re it's it's a reality, and we should celebrate that that church, that that body had its time, and it and the Lord used it mightily in that space mm-hmm. during that time. And I think when we be, when we begin to think that way, those churches that their time is ending, they have a capacity to sow uh, into up and coming ministries in a way that's more intentional. Um, and so your church can go out sowing a seed for generations in ministry, as opposed to kind of fizzling out and just dying. Right. Um, right. Right. And, and so we have to see the life cycle of, of ministries that way. Yeah. We did an episode not too long ago uh, with two folks who were, in, uh, who were really innovative in restarting churches. Um, so one was a, a, a district superintendent in the Wesleyan church, Tim Fox, who's in the South coastal yeah. district and a colleague of his that's in Washington, DC. And, um, and Tim as a, as an administrator, a leader in the church has, has really led pastors to do that, to, to kind of celebrate all that's done in that church and, and bring closure to that, but also recognize that it's time to rethink how the, uh, how the context and the culture is engaged and then, um, and Dan has done that in, in several different locations and written some work on that. So I'll, I'll point folks back to that episode if they're interested uh, in that, because that's a really bold thing to do. Um, but anyway, we'll, let's let's talk about yeah. church planning uh, new and afresh uh, from some of the ways that that you have have done that. Um, so when we see a, a location, um, in a, and I think in the United States and in many parts of the world where people are listening. There is at least some sort of presence of the church already. I, we're kind of past the age of history where there is no Christian ministry and presence in in that place. So, yeah. if that's the the way, say like Grand Rapids, for example, where you are, how does one even begin to start with this church planning process? Let's talk about that first. Yeah. So I say first thing is a foundational belief that no one representation of the body can reach all the people in that city. Wow. Go on. Right? Go so, on. So, so first of all, just practically speaking, no building is big enough. Well, yeah. <laughs> right? right. Right. No right. edifice will, right. <laughs> will, 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 will hold all of the right. people. Right. Um, uh, and so that's just practically speaking. 
But I think it's also okay. This is not, this is in no way um, uh, a diminishing or discouragement of all the various expressions of, of worship and, or, you know, um, liturgy. But the truth is if the only church, when the only expression of Christ um, was the Lutheran church or the um, Presbyterian church or the Christian reformed church or the Catholic church, I likely would not be a believer. Hmm. Okay. I needed something that was as charismatic as the church of God in Christ Mm. to even be appealing (laughs) to me. Right. right. And that's okay for us to know that that's, that's what that I love saying like, yes, Jesus made it very clear that he is the way to the father, but there are multiple an- on ramps to Jesus. <laughs> right? There's right. like, there, there's only one way to the father, but there's a myriad hundreds, thousands <laughs> of ways to get to Jesus. And that's the point. Like that's the, that is a right. beautiful thing, yeah. right? If he's the only way to the father, then we need as many on ramps to him as mm. possible. Wow. <laughs> and so I am not a person that that gets irritated when I see two churches right next to one another, just as much as nobody should be mad if a Burger King and a McDonald's are right next to one another. Some people want a Whopper and some people want a Big Mac, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. That's okay. They're both burgers. (laughs) But how we receive that burger Mm. is based upon how we're wired, how, Mm. and and ultimately to some of the cultural um, uh, dynamics that play in our life that the Holy Spirit uses as an evangelistic um, tool so that those individuals like myself who need a more charismatic experience um, get to actually experience Christ and then also have a relationship with the Father. And so I think that that's the foundations. Second, honestly, it sounds so super like Christianese and cliche, but to pray, what yeah. is it that the Lord needs in that area, mm. right? Like mm. that becomes the, the the foundations for what that ministry looks like. Ask sure. the Holy Spirit what's needed here right. um, and get on Google too, because yeah. <laughs> Google will also tell you what a, what a community needs. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the, one of the ways in which we, we, we knew that we needed to plant a multi-ethnic church. We started off multi-ethnic, right. but we knew that we needed to plant a multi-ethnic church because we asked, okay, Holy Spirit, where are you sending us? Yeah. And so that was the 49507 community of Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's a zip code um, in Grand Rapids. It's the largest zip code in Grand Rapids proper, but also has the most even spread of ethnic diversity than in any other zip code in Grand Rapids. Oh, wow. um, so there, um, at that time, there were about 13,000 Blacks. There were about uh, um, uh, 11,000 whites and about 9,000 uh, Hispanics on paper. Okay. Right. There were uh, Asians and Native Americans in lesser numbers, as well as there were, you know, any other group that, that made up about 4,000 people and those other ones. But nowhere else in Grand Rapids do you see that kind of even spread of ethnic diversity anywhere else, right? They, yeah. So because of that, okay, well, then that means we need to consider what it means to, to plant a multi-ethnic church because that's who these people are. Right. Their neighbors are, they more than likely live with people, do life with people who are not like them right. culturally. Right. So let's create an environment where we where we don't um, where we don't just have that be a superficial goal, but the vision is that is baked into the DNA of who we are, mm-hmm. um, because that's who these people are. So, it, and I think that's so important that we reflect the kingdom of God and the community in which we live. Um, some of it is just a matter of, of if you uh, chase or wanting to plant a church. I mean, you know, some of it is finding a location. Uh, you know, you happen to be very talented in being able to preach and uh, play music very, very well on both of those. I can attest to that firsthand. But not everybody can do that, right? So, uh, I mean, I can teach, but I'm sure not going to be able to lead music. So I need to find somebody else. And somebody else needs to be able to do work with the children and youth and, you know, the older adults and others. So how do you start to build even a team uh, around that when you may, uh, you know, Really, really be starting from nothing. Yeah, I, I um, 
uh, recruiting is an interesting dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, recruiting for like leadership. Um, I'd say that um, I agree wholeheartedly that as pastors, we, you know, lead pastors, we can't do all of it. Right. Um, but I do say this, we should care about all of it. So you there can't you be a lead pastor and not care about nursery ministry. You just can't. Right. Right. Those are still, you know, folks whom at the very least, you need to pray passionately about mm. it. If you can't figure out anything else, right. be a champion for praying passionately mm. for every area of ministry. And yeah. that's, again, all of this stuff is philosophical, but it shapes the decisions we make. That's right. Right. It shapes the decisions. Absolutely. We make. So I'd say um, I, um, I, I, when, we're, when you're planting a church, uh, you, whatever skills you come with are going to be the skills that get leveraged. So you may not be, um, you know, good. You can preach, you can teach, um, maybe not be music, but I know you in technology. So I know that you, <laughs> you you end up having to figure out tech stuff. <laughs> true, true. Um, and that's just true. Yeah. Right. A vi- so there is, there is some, to some degree, we recognize we're leveraging all the skills, gifts, and abilities that we have to, to build into this church. And what I don't have then I am intentionally seeking out cast vision for what this is. And the more I can articulate what that vision is, Mm -hmm. the better I am at articulating that, the the better those individuals are um, at knowing what they're signing up for. So one of the things that, you know, one of the things that we, I was, I was speaking with worship leaders, speaking with children's ministry leaders and that kind of thing and inviting them to be a part of it. But saying to them that, yes, we want you to come because you are gifted with teaching elementary students. That is going to be a blessing to our family and the kingdom of God. But we also want you to come because you're Irish, (laughs) (laughs) because we're planning a multi-ethnic church. And that (laughs) is right. You have to know from the beginning that that's what's going on. Right. right? We're not just Right. And so bring your Irishness to the table. Mm. And I know that's our context, but saying, but recognizing that that's a part of casting vision for that, for that ministry. Right. So if you are in a rural context and, and you are, and you're recruiting people to plant a church in a rural context, well, yes, we want you because you are gifted at leading worship, but we also want you because you understand agriculture and we are about to start ministering to a bunch of people who are potentially farmers. And what is the culture of farming Mm -hmm. that, that you will bring into this ministry that we don't put on the shelf and assume God doesn't want to use that. He only wants to use your skills that are good on a Sunday morning. No, every part of you we bring, right? So you are leveraging all of you. And you're inviting people to leverage all of them as well. Right. Yeah. And again, back to, it sounds a little practical, but it's very philosophical. You and I had a conversation not too long ago about church planning and taking it slow. Uh, And one of the things that you reminded me of uh, is that there are a couple different kinds of growth. And one is um, oak tree growth that puts around really deep roots and lasts a long time. And the other one is mushroom growth that pops up and easily goes away. And just a moment ago, before we started recording, I walked out uh, to go check the mail and I was walking across the yard. There was a mushroom that was not there last night, but it was there this morning. And, uh, and I thought, isn't that just a little sign as I'm about to get on this conversation with Chase that we had that conversation and you know what I did? I kicked it as I went by because, you know, it's just gonna, it's just gonna keep festering uh, in the yard and I'm trying to keep the yard looking neat. But, uh, to that, where, where I'm going with that is, um, I started, um, uh, we're part of a church plant. We started regular worship about seven months ago, just in our own facility here about the last two months. But before starting regular worship seven or so months ago, we uh, invited people to be a part of that vision, to pray together. And we met in the living room for well over a year, um, at least twice a week, uh, Sunday mornings and Tuesday nights. And we prayed and we were a part of the Wesleyan uh, habit of a class meeting where we looked at one another and said, how is it with your soul? Um, And that's what we're doing now. 
Uh, so in terms of that, you know, they're planning a church. It's been, you know, almost two years before we could ever get started from that first time that we said to somebody, we're going to plant a church to the point where we're meeting in our own space on a regular Sunday morning. And that's short for some people. And that's really long for some people. Uh, so it, through your experience of church planning, can you talk a little bit about that, about, you know, that long growth or, or that longer perspective? Um, I'd say one, uh, as a rule, nothing good grows quickly. Wow. I honestly believe that. And, and so the, and the only exception, only caveat to that is when the Holy spirit is uniquely doing something to make something grow quickly, Yeah. but also then the Holy spirit has empowered and equipped and, and provided for that growth as well. Right. If you have to burn yourself out and burn your people out to make it happen, that's not the Holy Spirit. Mm, preach, <laughs> right? Preach. <That's laughs> okay. Right. So the so the rule is nothing good grows quickly. Mm. Um, the exception is um, whenever the Holy Spirit was moving in a way that causes quick growth, He also provides for that growth too. Um, and so I think if if we have that as a rule then we don't burn each other out. The real, the, real, the real challenge of church planting is the amount of energy required to get anything off the ground. And this is not, this is not anything different. Grow, like starting a business is not, it's a different purpose, a different mission, a different reason, but it still requires the same kind of energy, the same kind of intentionality right. to start a church, Yeah. right? And so it's uh, the church and the and, and the marketplace are very different. I get that, mm. but we're not going to be so holy that we forget that we are called to do work as a piece of this puzzle. Right. We can't just sit there and just watch it happen. Yeah. So there's momentum building that's needed in that. I remember telling my wife when we um and I had a, I had spoken with a number of different church planters at this point because I'm a second born. So I'm really good at learning things secondhand. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> um, and uh, and so I had spoken with a number of church planters, and consistently across the board, they were all talking about two years in being burned out, two years in being tired, two years in not wanting to go to church, and um, and the consistent pattern was they were also ensuring that all the holes were filled in their household. Mm right? All the holes in ministry were being filled by the pastor, the pastor's spouse, yeah. by their children, by, yeah. right? And ultimately, then what ends up happening is we don't create room for other people to mature in ministry. Mm. And by two years in, I don't even want to go on Sunday. Right. Because, right? And so it's okay for us to know that just like everything else in life, this ministry is going to start with some holes. Mm. It just is. Yeah. And if I am trying to fill those holes in my own strength, then I miss the opportunity. I miss out on the opportunity for people to receive their call into ministry. And um, I put, I position myself to be burned out on ministry two years in and, and then no one, no one is in a healthy space at that place, yeah. right? At that point, no yeah. one's there. So, so if we're planting churches, we have to know. And sometimes that those holes are some of the key areas of ministry that we want to be there. Yeah. Oh, right? <laughs> right, right, right. And that's, but that's so. So that means then that the intentionality is church. We need to be praying for this particular space. If, if, if we need children's ministry leaders, right. then we need to be praying and building up. But it can't be that the, 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 the pastor's family now fills in all the holes yeah. as well, um, yeah. because, again, that, that's not a healthy model. Well, we were talking just this week um, with the leadership team of the church that I'm planting about um, a part-time ministry position that we're going to add. And yeah. uh, we were discussing, you know, just how quickly we wanted that to happen. And it was, well, you know, we want the right person there. And what I shared was the only thing worse than having an opening is wishing that you had an opening. 
Uh, and, 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 <laughs> and, oh, saints. <laughs> and that doesn't, it doesn't help anybody by choosing the wrong person for it, right? Just to hurry to, to slap a bandaid on something. It isn't fair to that other person who, um, needs to serve in the ministry in a particular way that it may not be a good fit at your church. They need to be, uh, serving where God has called them and, and, Ooh. uh, and the people to whom we serve, we, we owe it as well. And, um, and it needs to be some, some conversations that we just have that we're willing to do just what you said. Um, slow growth, slow growth is, is best. You give, you get, um, you give yourself an opportunity to catch up with yourself as you grow slow. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that ends up happening is that if we grow, if we, if we, we push too much energy into mm. growing either numerically um, quickly, growing financially quickly, growing even in our systems, if we're trying to go too quickly, then, then ultimately we're just growing with a bunch of gaps. Um, one thing that I know because I have a Great Dane, you want Great Danes to grow slowly. <laughs> um, because ultimately, if you put, they're going to get, they're, however big they're going to get, they're going to get. There's right. nothing you're going to do that's going to change that. But go. but their nutrition mm -hmm. can change how quickly they grow. Um, and if they grow too quickly, then they actually end up with problems in their skeletal system. Yeah. Right. Right. I feel like that's a whole sermon. No. <laughs> right. I'm writing that down for next Sunday. Listen. Okay. Listen. <laughs> um, and, right. So, so I, I, I think that, you know, you're, you're onto it. And just in terms of you want people to be in the right place. I remember saying in recruiting meetings, and there's one that, that sticks out. This person is now our outreach pastor. Yeah. She started off as our children's ministry director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she, uh, I remember saying to her and her husband that um, that we would be so glad for you to be a part of this church family. And um, her husband's our tech director now too. Okay. But um, um, and but only if this is where the Lord wants you, because if this is not where God wants you, then you're not an asset here. You're a liability, right? right? And being honest about that with each other too. Like this is not right. Like that idea of it being a good fit. If this is not the spot then it doesn't help us just say that we have this role filled. Sure. It becomes a liability to us in ministry that when you're 30 years in and you're well-established, it's not as much of a risk. Mm -hmm. When you're 30 days in <laughs> and if the wind blows too hard, your church is going to crumble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to make sure that you're discerning. <laughs> Holy Spirit, is this where this person needs to be? <laughs> right. Well, and, and you talked about entrepreneurship a little bit, and, and I think there's some parallels. So just hang with me here when I tell this story. Uh -huh. So a few years ago, I uh, was in a major metro area, and uh, there's a young man that I watched grow up, and he was an intern for me in youth ministry for a number of years. He went off to college and went off to, to business school, and he picked up uh, a franchise opportunity with a really growing uh, counter service restaurant. And, yeah. it, and really just started with some people that he knew in this university town. And so everything is entrepreneurial about this, right? So even the each in location and the whole franchise itself, incredibly entrepreneurial. And he has the opportunity uh, for all of the restaurants in this major, major metro area. So he's just growing really fast. And we have lunch and I'm watching this guy that I've known for so many years since he was a kid. And now he's a successful business leader in the community. And he's got hundreds of people working for him. And uh, through these different restaurants. And I said, John, I said, you, you got to teach me how you get people to work so well at what they do and how you get them to thrive in this and how you select them and, and what you do. And he said, Rob, uh, I've made it a rule to hire slow and fire fast. Hey. And I went, whoa, 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 wait, what do you mean fire wow. fast? And he said, you don't do anybody any favors by leaving them in the wrong spot because the team is being drugged down, they're being drugged down, and the next place where they're going to be and where they can thrive is, is being held back. So you need to release them to do that and do it in such a way that is is uplifting yeah. to everybody. Yeah. And you honor uh, people while you let them go. Right. So right. <laughs> so I'm in right. terms of ministry, we don't like to think about that, but I think we just need to have some really honest conversations about the ways that we can be with one another um in in the places where we're called to serve best. 
Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So then um, not only is that for individuals on a staff, when you're talking about church planning, put everybody in the right place, it may be for the church itself. Um, so uh, can can you talk a little bit about knowing the the culture in which you're planting the church and, and how do you begin to identify some of those things? You, you touched on that a little bit. So I will say that I have the the privilege of having planted a church in a place in which I'm very familiar. Um, when our family first moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, this is the part of Grand Rapids in which we moved to. Um, it's the part of the city that I am most familiar with. It's where I was educated. It's where all of my real close relationships were forged. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I love this city. I mm-hmm. love this part of the city. I pray for my city. I love Grand Rapids, Michigan. So that is a privilege. Um, and I know that, that, and I say it that way on purpose. Not everybody has that. <clears throat> Some of us are called to places that are not that, and, and it does require quite a bit of investment, excuse me. <clears throat> it co- requires quite a bit of investment on our part to, um, to, to uh, understand. Um, I say human beings are really good at, um, at talking about where they live. So asking humans about where you're planting is important. Going to, I remember, even though I knew a lot about Grand Rapids, yeah. I had never looked at Grand Rapids through the lens of a church planter. Mm. So I started talking to local church pa- leaders. So like I would set, I set up meetings with uh, pastors at, you know, in churches. One, because I wanted to understand what is it that they see in the city, but also too, I wanted to understand what are some of the unique graces that their ministry has as we consider, you know, potential partnership in ministry, like, you know, um, so it's a whole nother situation, but, but that going to local, you know, coffee shops, talking to people in the coffee shops about the city, talking yeah. like, and, and really in some ways becoming a little bit of an investigator, right? But from a curious standpoint, not trying to prove anything, trying to find out things, what is it that what is it that makes this part of the world work and function? Mm. And and um and that being one element, the other element having intimate relationships in the place where you will minister. Um that is a significant puzzle piece that that you so we're that's one area where this is different than a business our business is building people <laughs> right right we're not selling tires right we're right. building people everybody needs if you drive a car you need a tire so it doesn't matter whether or not i know you for real yeah right, right. when you're in the people building business we have to know people mm. in order to actually know what builds them up and so, yes, we can say the gospel builds them up. Yeah, but how we how we encourage them with the gospel isn't just as important as the gospel itself, because if they can't hear it, if they can't receive it, it's nothing. That's just the truth. Right. If we, you can't go to a place speaking speaking English and going to, to a remote part of Brazil, expecting them to receive the gospel just because you said Jesus, right. you have to know the people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, Chase, you had mentioned to us that you um, have been a part of a church planning culture or uh, been around church planning you know, most of your life, if not, you know, nearly all of it. Um, and many people who may be listening now are probably around church planning only for a handful of years. And if someone's at that point where, you know, they're, they're saying, look, you know, we did grow really fast. I'm just really feeling stressed and burned out. I'm wondering if I'm the one who needs to step away and, and, you know, fire myself Mm -hmm. or, Something like that, or or they're really hitting these walls of resistance um, to church, um, uh, whatever it may be going on. What what sort of advice would you give them, pastors and lay leaders both, um, in this time where they may be feeling burnt out and stressed, uh, maybe even for all the right reasons? How mm-hmm. do you how do you push through when it gets hard? Uh, yeah, I was I'll say one two one thing too. Burnout isn't always the reflection of something unhealthy. Wow. Right. Like, I think that's, and that's important. Like we, 
Um, and, and what I mean by that is, yeah, we may have an unhealthy rhythm of rest that kind of leads into burnout, but the organization itself, the church may not be unhealthy at all. The church may be healthy and you're just tired. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Take a sabbatical, right? <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Take a break. There you go. Right. And there's, and, and I, I, there is no good time for a pastor to go on sabbatical. Right. I know we 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 try to trick ourselves into believing that like, oh, I'm going to it's going to, you know, when this season is done or when that one is done. Trust me, you think it's going to be summer and that's the best time for outreach events for a church plant. So it's not summer. Mm. It's definitely not fall. You think it's going to be winter, but then you got Christmas, Christmas and yeah. then you've got right. <laughs> you got you think it's going to be spring, but no, it's just coming. <laughs> There's no good time <laughs> to take a sabbatical because and that's not the point. The The Sabbath was just as much about rest as it was about faith and trusting yes, God, yes, right? Yes. Sabbaticals are just as much about rest as they are about trusting God. Mm. And so if your church will not survive without you, that is a key indicator that it, that, that it will, that it, that, that it's resting too much on you and not enough on God. And there is so, it's so easy for us to become our, our church's idols. So sabbaticals are a great way of one, re, 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 receiving some rest for that leader, yeah. but also a great way for if that church is too dependent upon its leader, um, a great for them to way to affirm their dependence upon God um, and and to shake off any idolatry that may be present there as well. Um, so I say that I, I use the word idolatry on purpose too, because yeah. I think we've we you know we've we've done a lot of toying around with the ideas of unhealthy or like you, you know like mm, sometimes we, we just need to call it what it is. You know, right. we, we can become our church's idols, mm. um, like Gideon's ephod right it's like right, um, it's, right. it's not on purpose right it's not on purpose but that is just what happens um in our in our world so sabbaticals kind of shake that up a little bit so i would say that well and i also want to encourage people who are listening you know pastors take that sabbatical take that vacation if you're not a pastor and you're listening and you're part of a church you need to ask your pastor uh, are you taking a sabbatical? Are you taking vacation? And then you need to pony up to that and you need to provide the means and the support for that pastor to do that. It's better yes. for you. It's better for the church. It's better for your pastor. It's better for the kingdom to do that. Make Absolutely. that a priority and, and make sure that that happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I wonder if you could give us a story or two of where you have seen uh, one of these work. Uh, uh, I mean, you you come across a lot of them. Uh, kind of give us some pictures, not only from Grand Rapids, but maybe some other places that you've seen church planning thrive on some of these things that we've been talking about. The cool thing is because I I am on the board for the Great Lakes region of the Wesleyan Church, I get to be connected to a number of different, like you know, church plants and different things like that. So seeing models where rest is is an important factor in, you know for for those leaders um so I, i'm seeing that play out and we're talking a lot more about soul care and mental health yeah. um and those being key elements not just in the success of that pastor but in the success of that ministry mm -hmm. so that's you know so i would say like you know those are some those are some elements that even as we've just been talking about more re uh, recently in this conversation that that is imperative to all ministry health, but particularly church planting because of how much energy it requires to get a church plant off the ground. Right. You can't just walk in and it be set up. You have to do all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, being aware of mental health becomes, you know, I've seen, you know, being seeing that here, yes, in Grand Rapids, but uh, um, in places like, you know, you know, right outside of Detroit, but also um, in other Midwest areas as well, we're seeing that be kind of be in a sick, a, a marker of success. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the intentionality and recruiting. Um, mm. I, I feel like that uh, there's one church that I'm thinking of in Muskegon right now, uh, or excuse me, Benton Harbor, um, that, that is, that has been a huge puzzle piece for them 
um, that they're not they're not approaching recruiting for their leadership uh, vaguely at all. It's not like we're just taking the hill for Jesus. We're taking the hill for Jesus in this way, and we're asking you to prayerfully consider being a part of that in this way. Right? Yeah. Um, that's that's huge. It's important. Right. Right. Well, Chase, if someone's really interested in this, um, you know, in starting out planning a church for the first time or maybe uh, planning another church or, or pushing on through their own church plant, what kind of uh, hope and encouragement do you have to give to them? Mm-hmm. Uh, hope and encouragement. Ooh, I, I'd say that um, first and foremost, uh, you are um, uh, there is encouragement and hope and that the Lord has um, charged and called you to stewarding a representation of his body. Um, And that's a joy. It comes with a responsibility, but there's a joy in that that isn't for our glory. It's not for us, our esteem to be boosted, but there is a uniqueness to what that is that should cause us to, to marvel at the grace of God that he would say that, yo, I want to trust you to steward this. Mm. That's a beautiful thing. And we can and should be encouraged in our souls by that. Right. Um, and to not ever forget, this is Jesus's church. Yes. It's not mine. Mm. I, it doesn't rest on my abilities to you know my skills my capacity it rests on the capacity of Jesus <laughs> right yes. it rests on his skills on his capacity mm. and ultimately um if i am called to to be a part of stewarding life into this local representation of the church great if it dies tomorrow that doesn't automatically mean i i failed at my at my job right. sometimes the, this is i can say with confidence this is jesus's thing yes i steward faithfully and he receives both the glory and the honor out of that but also his sovereignty is a piece of the puzzle and i can, and i should not have so much pressure on myself that I missed the opportunity to allow him to be the Lord of his church, right? So so there is a balance in, let me receive the encouragement from the spirit that he's trusted me, Mm. but also let me not cross the line into believing that it's mine and I'm responsible for its life. I'm not, I'm responsible for being a faithful steward and Jesus is responsible for his church. Wow. That's beautiful. Chase, I think that's a great place to leave it. If people wanted to get in touch with you or learn more about what you're doing or what's going on at Unison Christian, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, um, best way is online, uh, unisongr.com. So it's be like Unison Grand Rapids. So unisongr.com is the website. Um, uh, and you can get in touch with me there as well. That's kind of like the best place. Like all of our things, like social media, YouTube, all of that stuff yeah. is connected to the website. Um, and so we'd love to connect. Um, I honestly love talking about church planting yeah. and particularly urban church planting. Mm. So um, there, there's not much that you, you know, that, that will wake me up without caffeine like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chase Stansel, I appreciate uh, your friendship and the way that you serve World Methodist Evangelism and uh, the broader church. Thank you so much for being on Real Faith, Real World. Thank you very much for having me here. One of the things I love about Chase is his wealth of experience and enthusiasm about it still. He is so wise about the things that are required in church planning. And I think not only just sheer techniques, but the posture and attitude of planting churches is something that Chase can teach all of us. You'll find uh, the links to his church in today's show notes, as well as all of our social media connections and ways to reach us. We'd love to hear from you with your comments, questions, suggestions, or thoughts for future episodes. You'll find all of the ways that you can reach us in today's show notes. And listen, if you are interested in these type of things that we've been discussing in Innovating Church, I want to encourage you to be sure to rate and subscribe. That helps you get 
more of the podcast uh, episodes as they come out and helps others know about it as well. And if you are based in Europe and you are interested in this, I want to encourage you to visit our website, worldmethodist.org, and there you'll find more information about Metanoia Europe. This is going to be the 29th of August through the 4th of September in Durham, England. It's aimed at people 18 to 35 who are serving or interested in serving in church, whether they are pastors or lay people. And it's just talking about all these different ways that we can be uh, impactful in our cultures and in our context in this particularly unique time. That's Metanoia Europe, and that's going to be the um, August the 29th through September the 4th. And you can visit www.worldmethodist.org for more information. Well, my thanks again to Christ Church Memphis for sponsoring this episode, and my thanks to my good friend Chase Stansel. And my thanks to you for listening. I'm Rob Haynes, and this is Real Faith, Real World. <laughs>